last video I briefly described what fractals are, where they come from, and how science benefited from them. I also explained how they can be drawn using Chaos Game. If you didn't watch that video and you want to know some more about fractals first, I advise that you start from the first video. Click the link below to watch it. In this video we'll focus on how to draw some fractals in 2D. We'll start from Sierpinski's triangle using Chaos Game and then we'll proceed to iterated function systems to draw Barnsley Fern, which is a bit more complicated fractal. Each of the examples will be implemented using C++ and OpenCV. There are obviously smaller libraries that can do the trick, but I chose OpenCV due to its simplicity when it comes to manipulating and displaying images, and also because I will demonstrate some more interesting examples using that library in the future. This video is not a coding tutorial, so I assume you have some basic knowledge about C++ or some general knowledge about coding. Before each coding example, I'll shortly describe each method we'll be implementing. We'll begin with Chaos Game and Sierpinski's Triangle. I described Chaos Game in the previous video, but here we'll get into some more details. First, let's try to generalize the simple version of Chaos Game I described in the previous video. If you don't know about it, please click the link below to watch the part of the video where I described the concept. There are three important variables that determine the outcome of the game. These are drawing rules, the set of structural points, and the number of iterations. By drawing rules I mean the distance that will be traveled from the previous point to the new point at each iteration. Time for some mathematics. In the simplest version of Chaos Game, we can describe the coordinates of the new point using the following formula. n plus 1 means new point, n means the current point, and p is the randomly chosen structural point we travel to. a and b are constants that determine what part of distance from the current point to the randomly chosen point we will travel. As you can probably guess, both a and b must be in range from 0 to 1. Otherwise, you will travel outside the fractal boundaries, or you will never move. In order to draw Sierpinski's triangle, we need three points that will form the self-repetitive triangle. Most preferably, they should form an equilateral triangle, but it's not necessary. Like I said in the previous video, we always travel half the distance, so A and B will become one half. Now let's proceed to coding. Okay, so first, as you can see, I'm using Qt Creator, and this is uh, a very nice environment I really like. I use it on Linux, and I especially like it because uh, you can configure the project using a PKG config, at least on Linux, and you can add libraries in a very uh, easy way. You don't have to include everything manually, you just tell a PKG config to include OpenCV or whatever you want. Uh, so following with the tutorial. Uh, first we are going to need some includes and uh, to define some namespaces, uh, sorry, to use some namespaces. So we include uh, iostream, which is the basic uh, thing. Uh, we also need vector because we are going to store the points in a, in a vector and we also need uh, C standard library for generating random numbers. I'm going to do it in a simple C way. Uh, obviously C++ has the new random generator, but it's not necessary here. Uh, okay, so we also need to include OpenCV uh, and cv.hpp include, e. okay. And we also need uh, OpenCV and high GUI, which is going to uh, be necessary for displaying the window. And let's not forget about namespaces. STD. I have a bad luck for typos today. <laughs> and using namespace CV, just to make things simpler and shorter. So let's proceed to coding the function which is going to draw our fractal. Let's call it draw fractal. As input, it's going to take a float x rule, which is going to, de to be the distance traveled in horizontal axis, and also a y rule for the vertical axis. And it's going to also take a vector of a 
coordinates uh, of the vertices that create our fractal. So for Sierpinski's triangle, it's going to uh, be a set of points which create a triangle. Let's go to points. And obviously uh, some iterations threshold. And by default, it can be 10,000. Okay. So we have the body of our function, which is going to draw a fractal. Let's see if it compiles. It does compile, great. And we can um, go to the inside of the function. So we need a point uh, which is going to store the last position. And let's say it's point uh, zero zero. And uh, if you don't know, a point 2f means uh, it's a floating point. Well, it's a floating point of which con contains two coordinates. So in two dimensions, you also have point 3f. Uh, right. And one more thing, if you're drawing a fractal using the simple version of Chaos game, uh, the best approach would be to start from the inside of this, um, well, it's not a mesh, but inside of the set of these points. And if you don't do it, if you start from, let's say, 0, 0, uh, it's going to converge anyway, but it's a more elegant, elegant approach, but let's skip it. Let's make it simple. Mm, we are going to need uh, the die walls. And uh, it's going to be the size of our points vector. Because like I said previously, you need as many wall di uh, die walls as uh, the points that create the fractal or the vertices that create it. Uh, next, we are going to need uh, what I'm going to call uh, upper right corner. This is going to be integer. And uh, this is going to tell us what's the uh, size of the window in which we are going to draw the fractal. We're going to code this function later. Uh, it's going to calculate it from the points we provided. Okay, so uh, the last thing to do here is to initialize uh, the matrix uh, or the image we are going to uh, fill with the points. And it's mat. Uh, mat is a matrix object in OpenCV, and it stores. Uh, it's just basically a matrix, but uh, it can store different uh, numbers like floating point or double or integer or uh, unsigned character, just whatever. And it can additionally do it uh, in various numbers of dimensions from one to three, I think. So uh, as the first argument, we are going to determine the rows, and it's going to be upper right corner dot x uh, now columns and finally uh, we need to specify the type of this matrix and let's say we want to draw black and white fractal so it's going to be cvuc1 and cvuc1 means that it's 8-bit image uh, it consists of unsigned character values and it has one channel all right so uh, one more thing, we need to uh, zero out all this matrix because otherwise we would have random junk in it. It doesn't do it automatically for some reason. So we have to do it manually. We are doing it here. And we can proceed to coding the loop. So from i equals zero to uh, the number of iterations we provided. And of course we increment the i. And here, we first uh, need to choose the random number. We, we need to choose uh, a point from this vector of points. So this is going to be the point we travel to. So let's do it quickly. Uh, we use random number genera generator function and uh, modulus die walls. So it's going to choose a point from zero to two if we have three points, right? And we right now need to uh, assign the point we travel to to some variable. Let's go to point two, uh, and it's going to be points at uh, R and D. So that's our randomly chosen point. Now we need to calculate the difference from uh, the last position to the, the current position. So let's call it a diff, and it's going to be point two minus point uh, minus last position. 
right? Uh, and I, I'm following exactly the formulas I showed uh, in the lecture. So right now we need to multiply this difference by uh, the distance we want to follow. So last position was x equals, uh, sorry, class equals uh, x real times difference of x and similarly at y it's going to be y rule times difference of y okay mm. and finally we need to draw this point in our image so we use some low-level pixel manipulation this function is a bit tricky because uh, we need to first provide a type. Uh, we are the type of the pixel or the type of the element in the matrix we are modifying. So here it's Einstein character because it's specified here. So we use U char, which is uh, basically unsigned character. It's defined in the OpenCV header. Uh, you can you can see type the U char as unsigned character. Okay. Mm, and here we specify the coordinates. So it's our, our last position at x and the last position at y. Mm, and we assign the value. So let's say we want to draw it black and white. So we just assign 255, which is going to be white. Because if you use unsigned char character, you have a range from 0 to 255, obviously. So uh, at the end, we just display the image. So we use mshow function. If you're familiar with MATLAB, it's the same. Let's call it fractal because this function ju draws just any fractal, depending on what you provide here. Mm. And obviously, we need to determine what we draw. So the image. So this function displays the image, but we also uh, need the program to wait for some key to be pressed because otherwise it would just uh, open and close the window immediately, so you wouldn't see anything. So wait key just fixes this. Okay, I skip this uh, determine window size function um, and I'm going to explain the details right now. Uh, it it, it uh, returns point to i and it takes uh, the vector of, of our points and uh, it's basically, uh, well, let's say you have some, um, some figure like a triangle or a rectangle or whatever. Um, uh, let's say we also know some constraints. Uh, this is uh, that we have um, that the lower left corner cannot be lower than zero zero. And we also know that we cannot travel a negative distance for the X or Y rule. And we also cannot travel more than uh, one. So if we know that, uh, if we want to determine the upper right corner or the window size, in this case, uh, we basically need to find the maximum of uh, the maximum of all those points, both in x uh, and y dimension. So we are going to iterate this vector in the loop and find the maximum. So point to i uh, maximum. Let's initialize it as uh, point to i. Uh, int min and int min, which is the minimum value that can be stored in integer. If we know it cannot be lower than zero, we could start from zero, but that's just my habit. Let's make it safer or whatever. And now, of course, we code the loop. Uh, i equals zero. Mm, i uh, is smaller than uh, points that size, obviously. And we increment the i. And here we do the following trick we assign uh, points at i, x to the x variable and the y variable we assign points that at y, uh, y. Okay, and now we need to uh, determine whether uh, this is uh, smaller or greater than this. And if it's greater, uh, since we are finding maximum, we are going to assign it to this variable. And finally, we are going to uh, return all this. Okay, so maximum dot x equals, and I will use a ternary operator because it's very concise and short, maybe not the clearest way to do it, but I like it. 
so if it's greater than maximum dot x we are going to return x and otherwise we are going to leave the maximum x unmodified so it will be just maximum x didn't I make a typo? Uh, no I think I didn't okay and the same goes to y Right, so this finds the maximum in both x and y axis, and we obviously have to return it. Maximum, that's all. Uh, one more remark, uh, you might have noticed that I use point 0.2f here, and here I use point 0.2i, which is not exactly safe, especially that float can be significantly bigger, I think, than integer. Mm, but uh, we know about those constraints of course you know I want to make this example as simple as possible but you could add some checks and whatever and the reason why I use point to f uh, for the points here is that we uh, every time we uh, move we iterate we multiply this by some x and y rule and this is always in range from 0 to 1, so obviously this cannot be an integer, and we could even use double for greater precision, but float is sufficient here. So we have it right now, and that's essentially all we need to generate a fractal using the simple version of Chaos Game. So the last thing to do right now uh, is to uh, initialize uh, the vector of those points, and to pass it to this function, to the specified rules, and to throw it finally. So, mm. we initialize the vector. Mm, sorry, point two f. <laughs> and we are going to provide coordinates for uh, triangle, for equilateral triangle. So it's base. Let's say it's going to be one thousand pixels wide. So. Uh, we push it back 1000 point uh, sorry from 0 0 to 1000 0 that's the base of our triangle and now we need uh, the tip of the triangle uh, and well of course it's in, in half of the width of the base and the height for equilateral triangle is the base times square root of 3 divided by 2 so uh -huh. in this case it's going to be roughly 866 okay so this makes our triangle and now we call the draw fractal function so for uh, x rule 0 5 for a y rule the same and for the vector of points, we provide our vector of points, which is initialized. And let's skip this. Let's make it default 10,000 for now. Okay. Uh, okay, it looks fine to me. It should compile. Keep your fingers crossed. Oops. Uh, points. Oh, of course, I need to uh, specify that we are pushing back a point. So, point to f every time. C++ is not that smart. <laughs> okay, so now it compiles and there we go, we have our Sierpinski triangle. As you can see, it's not very detailed, so let's add more iterations, so it's going to draw it in a better way. Mm. So, let's go with, let's say, 1 million iterations. Let's hope it doesn't kill my computer. Yeah, that was pretty fast. A perfect Sierpinski strangle. Okay, so that was pretty easy, wasn't it? We just have 61 lines of code, and this generates our very first fractal. I tried to make this example as simple as possible, so there is no user input. But if you want to play around with Chaos Game some more, you can wrap this in some GUI, and now you have some general knowledge how to draw fractals using Chaos Game. In fact, I made such program using Qt Creator, and you can find its source code on my GitHub. I provided the link in the description. What's more, 
You can extend this to three dimensions and draw amazing fractals. It leaves you with one problem though, namely how to create proper geometry. I'll answer this question in the future. Now we can proceed to a more elaborate example, and by the way, I think it's one of the most popular ways to draw fractals. In fact, Chaos Game can be used to draw what is known as AFS, Iterated Function System. I know, the name might sound a little bit scary, but the logics behind it are pretty simple again. Remember the fern I talked about in the previous video? It is described as a set of four iterated functions. Similarly, Sierpinski's triangle can be described with these functions. Usually, and also in this case, these functions are affine transformations. The transformations include translation, scaling, reflection and rotation. For AFS fractals, the rules are a bit different than in a simple version of Chaos Game. Before we proceed to drawing the fern, let's try to describe Sierpinski's triangle again, but this time using AFS. First, let's define what we need to draw a fractal using AFS. Obviously, we need the functions representing affine transformations. We also need to define the set of points we will transform using these functions. And finally, we need to iterate the functions at points. This rings a bell, doesn't it? There is one difference though. Instead of choosing a structural point randomly, you choose randomly the function you want to iterate. Let's explain what an iteration in terms of IFS is. Here is the set of iterated functions used to draw Sierpinski's triangle. Take a look at any of these functions. They are functions of two variables, x and y, and they also return two numbers, new x and new y, separated by the comma here. You start from some initial point or a set of points, choose one of these functions randomly and replace the point coordinates with the coordinates obtained from the function. Then you choose one of these functions randomly again and fit it with the last coordinates obtaining new coordinates. You do this over and over and if the functions are properly defined you will obtain a fractal. Now let's take a look at these functions. Like I said, they represent affine transformations. The first function is simply scaling. Whatever point you throw at it, it will divide x and y coordinate by half. If you fit a whole set of points, let's say a triangle, it will also scale it down by half. The second function is the same kind of scaling plus translation. It additionally moves the point horizontally by half the distance unit. The last function is scaling and translation again. This time, it moves the point both in horizontal and vertical axis. Alternatively, we can write down these functions using matrix notation in the following way. Personally, I prefer this form, since it's more concise. Let's see what the functions do. Imagine you start from point 0, 0, but let's skip replacing the coordinates for now. Instead, we'll start from 0, 0 every time. Let's see what will be the outcome and draw each point. The first function would return 0, 0, the second one would return 0, 0 0.5, and the last function would return 0 0.25 and square root of 3 divided by 4. We obtained the triangle! Now if you start at some point and choose one of these functions randomly and replace its coordinates with coordinates returned by the function and do this repeatedly, you'll obtain self-similar triangles. The scaling and translation will be repeated over and over successively, producing smaller and smaller triangles. And this, in fact, will produce Sierpinski's triangle. Let's take a look at the video showing this process. We can see which function is being chosen, what coordinates it takes, and what coordinates it returns. After a new function is called, it takes coordinates from the previously called function. If we speed this up, we can see it draws Sierpinski's triangle indeed. Finally, we can proceed to coding this example. Ok, so since we already have the previous project, we are going to add some lines of code to draw Sierpinski's triangle, but this time using IFS. Uh, we'll start with the functions which are going to uh, return the new point coordinates, I mean the iterated functions. So the first function becomes f1, let's call it this way. and it's exactly like in the lecture, so let's call it redval, that's the value we want to return, and uh, redval.x equals 0 0.5 times uh, bx, and redval.y equals 0 0.5fpy. Uh, 
and of course return okay so that's the first function it does the scaling and uh, well if you wanted to make a more universal program that's going to draw just any IFS fractal uh, you'd rather like to uh, represent uh, all those functions using matrices uh, like the matrix notation I showed you in the lecture but for clearance uh, here we are going to do it in the simple way f2 uh, point to fp and this is I'll just copy paste it because it's going to be very similar um, and here we add additional we do the translation so uh, by one half in x-axis uh, this is not necessary and one more time this is going to be our f3 and it does translation in x-axis by a quarter and in y-axis it does the translation by uh, square root of 3 divided by 4 okay so we have our uh, iterated functions and now we need a function which is going to draw the iterated functions uh, so we will actually copy paste this example since it's going to be very similar but this time we are not going to choose between the points from the set but we are going to choose randomly between uh, the iterated functions so let's call this function uh, draw Sierpinski IFS and we don't need this uh, we just need the iterations and uh, we'll start from last position which is going to be the same zero zero and well uh, die walls uh, it's going to be three this time because uh, we have three iterated functions mm, upper right corner uh, it's also not necessary because uh, we already know the size of the fractal I'll explain it in a while uh, image uh, is going to be let's say let's make it full HD so 1080 by uh, right okay again black and white image and we zero it out and um, here it's going to be the same we choose the random number again but this time uh, we are going to uh, do a different thing here depending on the random number we have chosen we are going to uh, pass uh, the last position to uh, the chosen function which is corresponding to the random number and we are going to update the last position so we could use either switch or we could use if and let's say we use if so if rnd equals zero we choose the first function so last position equals f1 of last position okay now uh, another function rnd equals one last position equals f2 of last position equals two last position equals f3 of last position right so we basically choose a random number uh, we um, select some random number <laughs> yeah and then we are uh, choosing the function which corresponds to it if it's zero we choose f1 if it's one f2 if two f3 and we pass the last position and update it and we do it every time every single time and in this way we're going to converge into the Sierpinski triangle obviously if those functions are correct and uh, here we are going to do a little trick uh, if we do this just like here if you draw this point in such the manner that uh, it just takes the last position x and y uh, we are going to draw in range from 0 to 1 in both axes and this is because uh, this the translation 
is also in range from let's say zero to one quarter like for example to, to, to one half or one here it's just zero here it's one half here it's uh something <laughs> here it's one quarter and uh it's basically it's limited to range from zero to one if you analyze it uh, so we need to stretch it out and there are two ways to do it we can change uh, the translations by multiplying them by some number, let's say 1000. If we want to 1000 by 1000 window, we just multiply it by 1000. I mean, each translation here. Uh, and this would be more uh, beneficial because we would have more digits to operate on. Because here we just operate on what's after the dot. And if we multiply it here, we would uh, have three more digits if we multiply by 1000, for example. But we're going to do it the simple way, not to, you know, not to break those functions. I mean, to keep them exactly the same as in the lecture. Uh, so we're going to stretch it here, let's say by 1000 uh, in x dimension. Not, not f zero uh, simply it's integer because we cannot use floating uh, point coordinates in OpenCV uh, for uh, obviously for addressing uh, the pixel in the matrix it must be integer so let's keep it keep it like this uh, let's call the image uh, Sherpinsky IFS and then there is wait key and uh, oh I modified the wrong function sorry <laughs> Here. That's what happens when you have too many functions and you don't know what you're doing. <laughs> it's not supposed to be here, but here. Right, now it's fine. We start from zero, we just run the number, okay. It seems to be fine to me. So now instead of calling this uh, function, we are going to call um, another function or let's call two functions actually so we can compare the results uh, and let's say one million iterations why not let's let it be the same and let's try to run this it compiles wow okay we have the same result this is our Sherpinski IFS, and this is our Sherpinski strangle uh, drone using a uh, simple version of Chaos Game. Now we can focus on the last example, Barnsley Fern. In this case, we have four iterated functions. Unlike the previous case, we have one extra requirement here. We need to assign different probabilities to the iterated functions. We do this in proportions 85 to 7 to 7 to 1. How to do that? Well, let's say we have a 100 wall die, or basically that we choose a random number in range from 0 to 100. Now if we roll 0 or 1, we use the first function. If we roll from 2 to 8, we go to the second function. If we roll from 9 to 15, we go to the third function. And if we roll from 16 to 100, we use the fourth function. So let's proceed to coding once again. We have uh, the previous example, and since we are using IFS, since we were using IFS and we are using it right now, uh, we are going to uh, modify the previous example. And I don't want too much rubbish, so I'll get rid of this. I'll also get rid of this. And we are going to modify this. I mean, what's remaining. We'll call this function draw Barnsley Fern IFS. And we're going to modify these functions. So we need one more function, that's for sure, because we have four functions for the Barnsley Fern IFS. And uh, we have to modify everything here. So I'll just clear it so we can start with it over and here it's just zero here it's uh, 0 0.16 uh, times py here it is um, 0 0.2 uh, times px uh, minus 0 0.26 times py 
here it is uh, 0 0.23 times px plus 0 0.22 uh, times py plus translation 1.6 and here we have minus 0 0.15 px plus 0 0.28 py 0 0.26 times px plus 0 0.24 times py plus 0 0.44 okay and finally we have 0 0.85 times px plus 0 0.04 times py and for y we have minus 0 0.04 times px plus 0 0.85 times py plus translation again 1.6 Okay, so these are uh, the functions for uh, the Barnsley Fern. Um, we need one more function here. Actually, it can be just else. And like I said, we need to choose between the function with different between the functions with different probabilities. So um, it was in proportions 85 to 7 to 7 to 1. So we are going to choose a random number in range from 0 to 100 first. So let's say Daywolves becomes 100, like I said in the lecture. And now mm, we have to uh, set the probability. So here it's uh, smaller or equal to 1, which gives us a range from 0 to 1. And that's the last part of the probability chain. Uh, it's the 1, I mean of the proportions. And now from uh, 2 to 8, so that's the seven in the chain of proportions. And now from nine to 15, uh, sorry, to six to fif 15, yeah. That's the seven again. And now it would be for 16 to 100, which is the FD, uh, 85 part. But it's just, uh, it's just going to be else because that's the last possible choice anyway. So uh, of course it's F4. So this is okay, but there is one more thing to do, and this is scaling again. Uh, if you analyze this system, you'll be able to figure out that, uh, first of all, in X, it's in range from uh, about, I think, minus 2.3 to something around 3. That's for X axis, since we have negative scaling, and oh, sorry, uh, here we have negative scaling. So um, this is the first thing. And the second thing is that uh, in Y axis, it's going to be in a range from zero to about three point something. I don't remember exactly. So I'm going to improvise a little bit because, well, we, we, we cannot exceed this range. So first we, we have to move it by around three because the, to, to get rid of the negative part when it comes to the translations, then to stretch it, so let's say by 150. And here we don't have any negative part, so we stretch it, let's say the same part, mm, the same amount of times. And it's now Barnsley Fern AFS, and we draw it. So this should work, and it actually works. Let's take a closer look because it's a beauty. Okay, we have a very nice barn slave fern. I am aware that this tutorial was more complicated than the previous one, but I hope that you have learned something new and you have a clearer vision about fractals than before watching this video. If you are confused or have some questions, feel free to ask in the comment section. In the next video, we'll wrap our minds around complex numbers and we'll add colors to our fractals. I'll show you how to draw a Mandelbrot set. This will be the last video about generating fractals in 2D, and next we'll sync in the third dimension. If you liked this video and can't wait for new tutorials to come, please subscribe and hit the like button.